Hey everybody. Today I'm responding to a video by some fresh-faced young Christians who seem to be making their first go at apologetics. Now that just sounds rude, right? I mean, why would I pick on them of all people with their bright-eyed novice enthusiasm and their 49 subscribers? Well, stick around a minute and you'll find out. Before that, let me explain how this came up to begin with. This video just appeared in my YouTube feed for some reason, and I decided to use it in a rehearsal for a live show I'm working on. What live show, I'm sure you're all eager to know? Well, it's a weekly variety show called Zadanza I'll be doing with Objectively Dan. We've been refining this idea for a while, because we want to do our best to make it an absolute blast with good pacing and a variety of bits, while also giving us a chance to just kind of chill out and interact with you. If that's the kind of thing that sounds fun to you, please go subscribe. We want to go live this summer, and the more subscribers we get, the faster we can get it up and running. The link's in the description, and I really look forward to seeing you there. Anyway, the more I interacted with this video, the more significance I saw in it. Which leads us back to why I decided to respond. I'm most definitely not looking to punch down at new YouTubers with almost no reach making basic square one arguments. That would be mean and a waste of time. I'm responding because I think this video tells us something about how the broader Christian culture perceives and interacts with the world of professional apologetics. That's a connection I don't see explored very often, and it's worth taking a look at. That said, I urge you all, when commenting, to be gracious with these people. Basically, treat them the way you'd have wanted an atheist to treat you when you were a believer. I mean, if you were. If you weren't, just try to put yourself in the shoes of someone who believes something you don't. These aren't hardened, opportunistic William Lane Craigs or Frank Turek's, so treating them with decency will reflect well on our community and just be the right thing to do. Anyway, here goes. Should we even believe in a god? Is there a higher power? As a Christian, can you defend that? Can you? Let's talk about it. Hey, welcome to the Summerbrook Student Podcast. I'm Tanner. This is my amazing wife, Mary. Now, there's one thing that just struck me right off the bat when watching this, and that's how awkwardly staged their whole introduction is. Now, don't get me wrong. We all stage things to hook an audience or make our content flow better, so I can't fault them for that. I mean, I just got done doing a scripted segue to a promotion for another channel. But there's a style of Christian presentation that parks in this weird, uncanny valley spot between obviously contrived script and pretense at normal conversation that I just find off-putting. It seems like a try-hard strategy Christianity adopted to come off as relatable, and it makes me feel like I'm being evangelized to. Now, I don't say this to pick on these two specifically. I have a feeling this is just stuff they naturally pick up from evangelical culture, and that tells me something about what this exercise is and where it comes from. And uh, we're going to dive into how can you defend the existence of God. So, uh, Mary, how would you start that off? Yeah, I would start off by saying this is a big question that you can come at a ton of ways. So we are going to turn this into a couple parts. Uh, so just know we're not going to try and answer this entire question. Yeah, so just, get, just do one defense. Just right now. Does it seem weird that there are tons of angles to approach proving God? That you'd need multiple videos to parse out his existence one step at a time? That seems bizarre given a God who wants us to know about his existence. Now listen very carefully to this next part. Mary explains how she started thinking about God's existence, and a lot of it is pretty telling. Uh, so yeah, what about, and it's also May the 4th, hey, May the 4th be with you. How would you defend the existence of God? Awesome. Well, I think, for me, this is something that I have wrestled with, especially when I hit college. I um, really got into apologetics at this age because I started wondering, you know, is God real? Is the Bible credible? How do I know these things? And so many other questions in there too. And so anyway, at that time, I basically broke down my faith into like step-by-step -step tiny pieces so that I could defend it in my mind, if that makes sense. Instead of just saying, these are all the things I believe for a while and walk myself through, well, I believe in God because of this. And then this makes sense to me. So this, and it was kind of like a, just almost like a mathematical equation of I've established that A equals this. So then B can equal, it does that make sense? Now this story just doesn't ring true to me. I guess there's nothing in it that's completely implausible or sounds like an intentional lie. It's just that it all sounds a little clinical. Somewhere in college, she suddenly wondered if God is real and the Bible's reliable, so she started breaking it all down into pieces so she could make sense of it. That's it. She never once explains anything about what prompted her to wonder. 
never describes her mindset or where she was at in life beyond, I got curious about this and I explored that. Did she discover new ideas at college that shook her up a bit? Did she temporarily backslide or have a crisis of faith? Maybe, but we don't know. How did she feel about it? We don't know. How much did she actually doubt? We don't know. Now, we obviously can't expect her to explain all these things, but the fact that she doesn't explain any of them makes her story sound detached and not biographical. Now, this might partly be for a perfectly understandable reason. Maybe part of it is she's just not an experienced storyteller. These two are young and not particularly polished, so I'm not here to dump on them for how they handle themselves on camera. But I do think there's more than that going on here. And this is where I first found myself comparing these fresh new Christian YouTubers to fresh new atheist YouTubers. When atheists tell their stories, they're usually interested in the raw personal details that show just how messy and uncertain their personal journey was. That's kind of the point, and it makes the whole thing feel real. By contrast, the skeletal structure of Mary's story sounds not just generic, but careful and controlled. Like it's not supposed to get too real, because it's all meant to take us on a predictable journey to an expected destination, which is a body of arguments that verify her existing God belief. It seems like the opposite of what a personal story should do, and hints that the whole exercise is fundamentally more superficial than it pretends to be. And so for me, the starting point was actually with creation, the fact that we're all here. Like, I believe that I'm here right now. And if you look at Rene Descartes, that was something he kind of talked about. Um, I think, therefore, I am. I think, therefore, I am is a lot different than I think, therefore, God is. It's almost like this journey is more pre-directed than philosophical. Um, there's like the Latin phrase, ergo something, <laughs> if you remember what that was. But anyway, so I I'm sitting here and I believe this is a real thing. I don't think I'm dreaming right now. Um, so if I've been created and the world around me is created, well, where did it all come from? And I know that I don't believe that something came from nothing. So I would start there. Okay, raise your hands if you thought this was what she was going to come up with. I mean, it probably had to be this, Pascal's wager, argument from design, or maybe argument from morality, right? I don't know. Tell me what you thought it would be in the comments, I guess. But really, one of these arguments might as well have been another for all I care. They all come out of the same standard grab bag of scripted lines Christians default to when looking for an offhand justification for their faith, and I think it's telling that Mary just happened to land on one when independently exploring why she believed in God. Now again, I don't necessarily think this means she's lying. I suspect it's something more deep-seated and unintentional than that. I would say, okay, if something did not come from nothing, and this is not just something, by the way. This is highly ordered. There's so many incredible constants, gravity, second law of thermodynamics. You can go on and on of just the fine tuning that you see. But even if this was just a glob, I still wouldn't think it just popped out of nothing, you know? And so starting there, something had to put it there. So I guess maybe you get credit if you chose fine tuning, even though it was kind of an aside. But who cares? It's not like I'm going to mail you a pizza roll or anything. But you can probably all see what's going on here. After giving us what amounts to the Kalam cosmological argument as if it were something she just randomly started thinking about all by herself in college, she starts whipping out apologetic talking points almost word for word. Something from nothing. It's all so highly ordered. Incredible constants. Second law of thermodynamics. Fine tuning. Just a glob. Popped out of nothing. I'm not sure she realizes what an obvious tell this is. This body of phrasing was generated by and resides almost entirely within a closed apologetics community. So by rattling them off the way she does, Mary's giving us a very strong hint that she's just mimicking things she heard from that community. It's very hard to imagine that she independently came up with this vocabulary while exploring reasons to believe in God. And yes, just so I don't hear about it in the comments, I know some phrases like the second law of thermodynamics technically exist in other contexts. That's obvious. But when a Christian invokes them when talking about proof for God, we know exactly where they got them. So again, let's contrast this with a new atheist YouTuber. Sure, that person is going to pick up a lot of ideas and vocabulary from the community around them. But they usually use it in a fairly open-ended way, and hopefully this is just part of a growing process that gives the person vocabulary to express their doubts while starting off their journey. 
By contrast, Mary's use of apologetics jargon just feels more structured and self-reinforcing. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't perceive it leading anywhere open-ended. Mary even hints that it's not meant to go anywhere open-ended by stating her goal is to defend what she believes. And so with that, you know, you can find people that will say, okay, well, maybe it was an alien life form. Technically speaking, what is God except a specific kind of alien that Christians have a preset disposition toward? Okay, well, who put the alien there? Well, maybe, you know, and you can fill in the blank, but eventually you have to keep asking the question, who was there? Because there has to be somebody outside of space, outside of time, that could get everything started. Why somebody? I mean, we all know this isn't a good argument because it takes huge shortcuts toward conscious agency. My question is how she came to this conclusion. Was she just sitting around pondering the origin of the universe when suddenly it hit her that it had to have come from a conscious being outside space and time? <laughs> yeah, right. But it sounds like that's what she's implying, and she more or less comes out and says it here. Something that didn't have a beginning had to get everything started if we are going to buy that something didn't come from nothing. And even if people say, you know, there was that primordial soup argument of the, the molecules sort of just came together. Well, where did the molecules come from? Where did these gases that were there, where did they come from? So, you know, and that we can have a whole other discussion about whether we feel like that's legitimate or not and all of that. But the bottom line is, if something did not come from nothing, there had to be a something. And so that was my starting point. I think that something got this started. And logically in my mind, if I'm saying that there was a thing that got this started that had to be outside of space, outside of time, then I think that a deity is the best explanation for that. I found this extremely interesting. And by this point, I'm seriously struggling to hear this as a real sincere story. The way she tells it, she was thinking about where molecules and primordial soup came from, and she realized something had to get it started. She decided it was logical that this thing must be outside space and time. She concluded that a deity was the best explanation. And I don't mean to imply that she personally can't figure out anything for herself, but this is also straight out of apologetics. It sounds laughable to hear someone claim they sorted it out independently in college. But I'm still willing to give her the benefit of the doubt and assume she's not full-on lying. Maybe she's just unconsciously reimagining her story in hindsight. Maybe apologetics is so pervasive in the world she grew up in that she felt like she was having original thoughts, when really she was just making connections that other people had always been suggesting to her. Kind of like every high school kid who thinks they're writing an original science fiction story. Maybe evangelical Christianity is such a closed system of ideas that plugging through a few apologetics books feels like doing your research, so she mistook her experience being spoon-fed a single basic narrative for a journey of personal discovery. The problem here is that the more charitable you try to be to Mary personally, the more insidious things you realize about Christianity and how it teaches you to think. Or to think you're thinking. Yeah, uh, William Lane Craig uh, says it uh, this way. He talks about the Kalam cosmological argument that goes... What? Can you say that again? Kalam cosmological argument. Ooh, smart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now come on, guys. You both know very damn well what the Kalam cosmological argument is. I mean, I get that they're trying to be playful here, but something about this kind of play acting like she wasn't already fully aware of the Kalam just doesn't sit right with me. Yes, maybe we're meant to assume Mary already knows about it. Maybe this was meant to be seen as pure joking. But I don't think it's completely meaningless joking. It kind of implies something. But before getting to that, it will help to see what Tanner does next. I'm going to speed it up because it's just incredibly standard, tired stuff we're already familiar with. First premise is, step one, um, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Premise or conclusion, therefore, um, the universe has a cause. And so, one is everything that begins to exist has a cause, so nothing, uh, everything comes from something. That things can't come from nothing. That's what you were saying. So that's the first premise. If you agree with that, then we go to the second premise. The universe began to exist, and basically all of science now is showing that the universe has not been here eternally. That it had a beginning point, and it said the Big Bang. And Christians actually think the Big Bang is a reason not to believe in God, but the Big Bang actually is a reason to believe there is a God because it shows the universe had a beginning, which means it had a cause. Um, because everything that begins to exist, a cause. The universe had a beginning, so therefore the universe has a cause, which points to something outside of time, space, and matter. Um, as an intelligent and as personal because it had to have the ability to choose to start something when there was nothing, to, to choose to start it. Um, and so what is that personal, intelligent, outside of immaterial, timeless, spaceless thing? It points to a higher power, which is God. And so we don't get the Christian God yet, but that definitely gets us started with, wow, believing in God does make sense. Basically, this was just a retread of what Mary already explained. So why did they do this? Why have Mary lay out the first cause argument only for Tanner to come in behind her and mansplain the whole thing as if we'd never heard her? 
Well, there's actually a potential method to this madness. To see it, it will help to view this video not as an attempt to argue for God's existence, but to sustain some weird fantasy where the world of the average Christian and the world of the egg-headed apologist are two separate places that rarely communicate with each other. At a glance, this might sound like a strange and possibly irrelevant suggestion, but stick with me for a moment, because I think it taps into something Christians are highly invested in believing about themselves. They want to think their beliefs are based on fairly obvious, evident reality. That the average person can come to believe in God by diligently observing reality, and that once they believe, they can persuade others by conveying what they themselves learned. This idea elevates Christian belief to something not only scientifically justifiable, but scientifically inevitable. And it makes Christians look like independent thinkers who believe what they do because they thought for themselves. But these perceptions make a lot more sense if you maintain a wall of separation between, on one hand, the apologetics community, and on the other, the Christian community at large. If the two groups live in more or less separate worlds, then arguments for God weren't dictated to Christians. They just discovered the evidence by going around freely exploring truth for themselves and, who, what do you know, it happens to be exactly the same thing apologetics already explained in more systematic terms. But if this is not the case, if apologetics is just feeding most of the answers into broader church culture, then Christianity looks like a closed system of thought where believers are just going around mindlessly parroting a prepackaged body of rationalizations concocted by apologists. Sure, most Christians aren't walking around with their noses in a book by William Lane Craig or Josh McDowell, but we all know very well that every argument they use was passed along to them, either in personal conversation or over the pulpit, by somebody who did read those books. And this just isn't a flattering look for the religion. That's why I think this video plays out the way it does. It actually uses a surprisingly methodical story structure to let church culture disavow itself of dependence on professional apologists. In this narrative, Mary takes on the role of your average Christian who reasoned her own way to faith, and Tanner plays the seasoned apologetics nerd. And by seasoned apologetics nerd, I mean he parrots apologists down to the phrasing and even uses William Lane Craig's graphics. The reason the arguments get laid out twice is that we need to hear Mary explain that she learned it all by herself before Tanner gives the official script. And this wall between their stories is reinforced by her absurd pretense at not knowing what the Kalam is. Now maybe I'm reading a lot into a silly joke by a woman playing the part of an airhead next to her husband who's a total chat of an apologist. But this fits the narrative way too well. It pivots us from the average Christian part of the story to the apologist part of the story, and I can't help but suspect that her pretended ignorance is meant to reinforce her story about figuring out what she did without apologetics. In fact, this, I did it all by myself thing is so important that she reacts to him by explicitly reiterating it. That's awesome. I love that you were able to synthesize what took me years to work through in college into like two minutes. Yeah. So she worked through a bunch of philosophy on her own and came up with conclusions that look exactly like apologetics and use a lot of terminology from apologetics. And this strange claim seems like the main thing the video wants to convey to us. Most of its focus and everything about its structure is centered not on the arguments themselves, which are basic to the point of being mundane, but on making sure we know Mary found Jesus just by going out there into the world and exploring truth. It's role play designed to mimic stories about struggling with doubt. But unlike real stories about doubt and deconstruction, which are messy and end with some change in the person's thinking, this one is neat and sanitized and ends with a character meeting her stated goal of believing what she did from the start. And the point is that you, average Christian, can as well. Truth isn't scary. It's not even unpredictable. Just go out into the world and you'll quickly find that everything you learned at church was true all along. And you don't need an apologist to explain it for you because we Christians are the real free thinkers. I'm going to reiterate one more time that I don't think Mary and Tanner set out to lie. Hell, I don't think they're sophisticated enough storytellers to build this narrative structure on purpose. More likely, they just think and communicate in terms of tropes they picked up from Christian culture. I didn't want to believe in God, they've heard Lee Strobel or Josh McDowell or whoever else say for years, but then I examined the evidence for myself and could no longer deny his existence. This narrative is extensive and pervasive, repeated over and over in various forms throughout Christianity. It's all a total farce meant to comfort Christians with false certainty. And until they see it for what it is, they won't understand where they get their ideas or why, nor will they understand most of their interactions with the world. I hope the best for Tanner and Mary. I really do. 
I think they're the victims of bad ideas expressed in absurd narratives, and I hope their journey leads them to more intelligent ideas and to a more lucid internal dialogue about where those ideas came from. This program was made possible by a grant from John Adams, Bob Generic, Maggie Danger, S.R. Foxley, Daniel Bostet, Magnus Holmgren, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.